in Kansas City. And uh, Dr. Shirani is going to be uh, uh, contributing as well uh, in uh, all areas, but mainly in the area of three-dimensional echo. And he's got some fascinating and exciting stuff for us. Then there's the Professor Mark Friedberg at the back. Mark, Mark uh, uh, is um, trained with us at Stanford when I worked there, and he's now at, uh, at the Children's Hospital, Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, where he's a member of the uh, esteemed uh, division there. And Mark has uh, spent his life looking at heart failure and um, uh, the newer aspects of uh, ultrasound and strain and strain rate imaging. And he's going to be talking to us about advanced Doppler and ultrasound techniques in understanding uh, the mechanics, myocardial mechanics and so on. Um, and then uh, Dr. Karen Hasbani, who's uh, from the Advocate Medical uh, S System in Chicago and Lutheran General Hospital. Dr. Hasbani is a pediatric cardiologist who trained at the Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda in Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And she is a general a cardiologist, an ultrasonographer, but particularly an expert on magnetic resonance imaging. And she's going to be talking in, in terms of magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and I'm Norm Silverman, and I, uh, I'm currently working this week at the uh, University of California, San Francisco, with Dr. Rudolph. And um, I'm going to be trying to uh, give you some basic uh, understanding uh, uh, and ideas in the various sections which you see in your program. And the way we're going to organize the program is, on the first part, Dr. Sanders will introduce the program. Then Dr. Rudolph will discuss the, um, the basic physiological, embryological, developmental aspects of pediatric cardiology. I will discuss basic uh, cardiac ultrasound. Then um, Dr. Shirali, I think it's you next, Girish. Uh, uh, He's going to show us uh, three-dimensional images and rendering and so on and so forth. He's got some very exciting stuff for you. Um, and he's also intimated that he would be prepared to show you how to actually crop uh, these images so you have some personal instruction on that. Dr. Friedberg is going to be talking about his advanced sections and Dr. Uh, Barney will talk about magnetic resonance imaging. And then we're going to have a perspective from Dr. Rudolph again. And then we've got time for you to ask questions. Um, uh, so uh, feel free, um, we'd like to meet all of you uh, during the coffee breaks and get to understand who you are and what you want and uh, so we can dynamically change the course as we are doing it. Alright, and so we're going to start on the first section, I hope. It looks promising. Do you want to give me a microphone? I really need one. I'm known as the whisperer. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yes. Let me do it this way. Huh? Okay. And um, I need some power. Yeah. Just like... Uh, yeah. Girish, I'm going to pull your uh, power source out for the time being, huh? Okay, um, where am I? Where am I? Yeah, I'm in. Oh, I'm in. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, I. Yeah, I put it on my belt. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're getting things together. Probably in four days' time, we'll have it all organised. Um, Alright, so, um, all right, so um, just by way of introduction, um, this is uh, the University of California in San Francisco where I'm currently working in this building over here. And uh, these are the areas where I formerly worked at uh, Stanford. This is uh, Stanford University uh, and uh, the tower named after the first graduate from the engineering school, uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, who became president of the United States. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the sort of physical aspects of what we need to know and understanding M-mode, 
I'm going to leave uh, the two-dimensional Doppler for Dr. Sanders, who's going to be doing that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Doppler and color flow. And I've allotted myself 25 minutes uh, to do this talk. I have to remind myself how long to talk, because otherwise I could talk all day. So we'll start off first by looking at what is called a Schlieren chamber. A Schlieren chamber is um, a uh, polarized light system that's placed over a water bath. And here is a transducer. And these transducers here, two models of the Schlieren chamber, are used to test the quality control of, a, of a, an ultrasound transducer. And so you can see that um, although this is ultrasound, that it has somehow obeys Snell's laws of light so that it can be uh, transmitted, it can be reflected, and it can be refracted. Okay, so those are the three properties that ultrasound can do. And obviously what's most important for us is the sound that strikes a subject and comes right back to the transducer. And so as it sends and it receives, it acts uh, initially the the barium titanate crystal of which the uh, ultrasound is excited by an electrical signal, and then it listens, and then instead of the excitation, the crystal then vibrates, and that is amplified through a series of amplifiers and produces ultrasound. Now, the first ultrasound actually was developed here in Europe. Um, uh, this is the first ultrasound machine ever, and these two people are Helmut Hertz, Hertz is the grandson of the gentleman for whom uh, the frequency is known, uh, Carl Helmut Hertz, and a Swedish gentleman called Inge Edler, and they got this um, uh, from the Second World War from metal testing. You know, in order to have armaments that uh, uh, resist um, uh, uh, shells, the metal has to have no flaws in it. And it was tested with a metal tester, uh, which was an ultrasound crystal. And so that set up uh, this uh, ultrasound. And Dr. Edler was a, a, a Scandinavian Swedish physician. And what he did is he parts, passed the signals and he used something called A mode, which is amplitude mode, where the reflecting signal is proportional to the, uh, the intensity of the reflective nature. And he saw something moving backwards and forwards and he said that's the pericardium. And fortunately or unfortunately, his patient died and so he took an ice pick when he died and he said, this is where I put the ultrasound transducer down. Whoops. And that's what he did. Here's the two ice picks. And he saw indeed that he wasn't looking at the pericardium, but that indeed he was looking at the mitral valve, which was moving backwards and forwards. And that is really the, the origin of ultrasound. And I think that we also have to be very thankful as cardiologists that... Um, that this was the first discovery, because if we saw images, the radiologists would have grabbed it and they would never let us have ultrasound. So the thing is that the reason why this uh, is a discipline resides in cardiology is largely related to the fact that it was a signal and cardiologists like signals and radiologists like images. So that's how uh, ultrasound came to be part of our, our data. And you can see here, beam, how it's uh, connects. There's a, a near field, then there's a far field divergence. The resolution of the ultrasound requires two wavelengths, and of course the frequency of the wavelength defines how closely uh, you can separate signals. So for example, a 2 megahertz uh, crystal has got about a 0.5 of a millimeter resolution, and a 10 megahertz crystal has got 0.1 of a millimeter of resolution. You need two wavelengths in order to see uh, these things apart. Now, uh, one of the things about that's important that we always have to consider is gain. If you increase the gain on a system, then uh, conceptually, instead of getting a beautiful image like this, you get an image that looks something like this. And so if you look at the cavity, the cavity gets much smaller here. So basically, you have to keep the gains down. And then if you look at the leading edge to the leading edge technique, that always remains a constant. Or the trailing edge to the trailing edge always remains a constant. And it's something that we have to understand in terms of when we look at the amplitude of the signals, what happens to the signals and how big the processing is and the sensitivity of the signals. Now, I've explained near field and far field. The near field relates uh, to um, the wavelength. 
and to also to the radius of the transducer. Now, fortunately, when we talk about um, phased array technology, the uh, crystals are much larger, and in fact, their uh, uh, near field and far field characteristics relate to the size of the crystal the whole series of crystals. So you get much better resolution with bigger crystals than with smaller crystals. And of course, there are ways of focusing the sound beam to areas where you need it. Once you can focus in a certain area, you can keep the beam fairly narrow. But once it goes beyond that with an acoustical kind of lens, this is an acoustical lens here, uh, then the, the beam will diverge. Now today, all of this focusing is not done with acoustical uh, images only, but it's done electronically, and electronics can fo focus a system at many places, as you see on your ultrasound systems uh, that uh, are in use today. So let's just talk a little bit about another uh, German guy, Christian Johann Doppler, who was really a physicist and was, like Hubble, interested in whether the universe was expanding or contracting. And uh, so what he did was he did an experiment where he took some trumpeters in a railroad car and he took some people with perfect pitch and he placed them along a railroad line and then he asked the trumpeters to emit the note A and uh, then the people who were uh, with the perfect pitch would tell the frequency and he found that the frequency increased when the trumpeters were coming towards the, the observers and decreased when it went away, much as you hear when you hear ambulance uh, sound. So that compresses the molecules and makes them uh, closer. And he developed this equation called the Doppler equation, which says the change in the frequency is proportional to FO, which was the note A, uh, the velocity, and how, what the angle was that the people were uh, next to the, um, the, the railroad card and over the constant which was the carrier frequency of ultrasound. And so here you, you see uh, the great equation of Christian Johann Doppler that we use all the time to calculate cardiac output and things like that. Now with Doppler, we call this technique the pulse Doppler technique, was actually um, uh, put into clinical practice by a guy called Sotomura in, uh, in, um, in Japan. Um, uh, and uh, there are two kinds. There's the pulse wave where the signal that emits the sound also has to listen to the signal. And then there's continuous wave where there is one uh, signal always emitting and one uh, signal always um, receiving. And so on the, this one, because we know uh, how the sound is conducted, there is what they call frequency ambiguity. It can only uh, tell the frequency depending upon the sampling rate. And in this one, because it's constantly in place, uh, the frequency uh, is well defined, but the ambiguity is the ambiguity of where the signal is coming from. So we use this for calculating volume flow, and here's the calculation, and basically it's a how far, I beg your pardon, how far a column of blood moves in a certain period of time, and the, the mass of the blood is defined by the... Um, um, by the area and the height. Uh, the area is the area of the uh, sampling area where the, where the signal is obtained from an aortic valve or a pulmonary valve or somewhere in the, in the vascular circulation. And the, um, the distance traveled is the time velocity interval. And so uh, that gives you an area in cubic centimeters, uh, which uh, is, could be averaged over time or over cardiac beat, and that gives you the stroke distance. So we use that for calculating flow, as you understand. And here's an example of a QPQS in a child with a ventricular septal defect. And we've measured the sample of the velocity in the ascending aorta and in the pulmonary artery. And we measured the velocity time integral uh, uh, over here in these two um, uh, different areas, the diameters of the vessels, and we calculate the QP. QS, uh, pulmonary systemic flow ratio. You can do this uh, by simply just knowing that uh, the, the velocity time interval can be reduced to a triangle of uh, a height and the base over two. The base over two is the time interval. So that's very small. It could be halved and the cross-sectional areas. And therefore, you can obtain cross-sectional areas and uh, peak velocities and calculate uh, the QPQS ratio that way as well, just as I've described here. 
um, on the, um, the example. So pulmonary artery diameter times aortic diameter or over the aortic diameter squared times the ratio of the pulmonary velocity over the aortic velocity. As uh, we said earlier on, these, the, all the lectures are loaded on the website, so if there's something that you can't follow, you can just download it on the website and spend as much time as you want to looking at it. And I hope that you'll do this over here because I still cannot write out the Bernoulli equation. But uh, Bernoulli was uh, part of a great uh, Swiss family uh, that were constantly involved in physics. And here's his uh, equation, the Bernoulli equation, which uh, contains several different uh, um, characters to it. And what we use for pressure is we use this simple little uh, convective acceleration variety here, which is four times the, the, uh, the, 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 the pressure difference is equal to four times the velocity squared. And this is uh, the calculation for how this comes about. Uh, we go from gram centimeters per second, convert down centimeters into millimeters of mercury, and that comes out to 3.972, or roughly 4, and hence 4 V2 squared, which is the equation we use here, unless we're looking at uh, small pressure changes, where we also have to know the velocity proximal to the gradient. And I think that's very important when you consider exercise, where the whole circulation increases in size, and the proximal velocity increases as well. So you really have to consider the situations where you calculate the velocities. So we can look at, uh, for example, in this patient who's got uh, pulmonary stenosis and look at the velocity. You can see that that's an abnormal valve. And now we get a nice angle across this area and we can see uh, the velocity of the flow here. And uh, using the 4V squared velocity, the machines automatically will give you the velocity in meters per second as well as a presumed transvalvar pressure drop. Now this all looked very great until we worked out that uh, our colleagues in the cath lab were looking at the uh, the peak-to-peak um, -peak gradient and not the peak instantaneous gradient. So the Doppler is fairly smart. It can only measure events at the same time. Whereas a, in a cath, you can just look at peak differences and measure the peak even when they temporarily at a different period of time. Uh, and I think this example shows you uh, very clearly in a dynamic uh, example from the Mayo Clinic, the peak to peak gradient, uh, the peak instantaneous gradient here uh, compared to the peak to peak gradient, which is only 27 versus 40. Okay, and of course the Doppler reads at the instantaneous gradient. It can't read different gradients. So that's one of the reasons why sometimes when you make a measurement of gradient, it's somewhat larger than the estimate in the cath lab. The other reason why it's larger is because the pressure recovery uh, in the pediatric patients with uh, uh, aortic stenosis, for example, show that um, there is what they call a recovery of the pressure differences. And... Um, uh, using this complicated set of equations over here, you can then calculate the actual perfect uh, gradient, which is almost uh, uh, in unity, compared to the peak-to-peak -peak gradient, which is off here. But if you just look at mean gradients, the mean gradient is very much like the, the, the gradient, and of course this is obtained uh, by integrating the whole velocity gradient over the time of the, of, of the stenosis, and this um, is really almost as good as the pressure recovery time uh, with the differences that are clinically insignificant uh, and uh, can be used in clinical practice. And now we take all of these measurements and we can use them to assess um, a pressure, for example. Here's a patient who's uh, got a patent ductus. And here's the continuous flow across the patent ductus in systole and diastole. And we see the peak velocity and then the, uh, the low velocity over, over here in diastole. So uh, there's a constant pressure drop between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Uh, there's also tricuspid regurgitation. And so we can use these measurements to evaluate pulmonary artery pressure. And obviously, when you have a high velocity like this, this is obviously a restrictive patent ductus arteriosus. And when you get down to levels like this, where there's very little difference, then it's usually associated with the larger ductus. We're going to discuss that later on. 
The other thing that we use is the continuity equation, which is a measurement of uh, stenotic areas. And it says basically that if uh, all of these uh, assumptions are clear here, that the area times the velocity proximally is equal to the area times the velocity different, uh, distally or at the, at the site of the stenosis. And so we can solve for this equation by taking A1, V1 V1 over V2 here and calculate the uh, area uh, across a stenotic valve. Okay. Um, people have used um, these um, velocities to look at uh, DPDT. And here is a, a Miller catheter um, example of DPDT as well as an instantaneous Doppler equation. Now, one of the disservices that we've done for people in Doppler is to look at uh, things that we can measure because we can square one and we can square three. And we can get 36 minus two on the 4V squared data. And there is obviously along this line a, every measurement of a DPDT, but what we're really looking for is the peak DPDT. And now with the modern computers, we can get the maximum rate of acceleration at the very small levels and actually get to where the peak DPDT is, if you think that that's a useful index of ventricular function. But certainly the way it's currently applied, um, uh, it's not a very valuable measurement. Um, so here's a, another example of how this used to be done. And uh, obviously, if you look at these two examples in the bottom here, here's the peak DPDT calculated with the standard formula. And here's the peak DPDT calculated with an acceleration at the peak rate of rise, which is uh, over here usually in the isovolumic period. Uh, and uh, it's a, a really quite a lot different. So um, the computerized techniques that we have on all of our ultrasound machines allow us to do this if you want to do DPTT. Now, another index that was, has been used is the TAY index. The TAY index uh, um, is otherwise uh, known as the uh, myocardial performance index. It really is an index related to loading conditions. And uh, this is the... Um, the uh, systolic time between uh, closure and opening, and the ejection time, which excludes the isovolumic contraction time and the isovolumic relaxation time. And the Tay index is uh, these two intervals over systole. So it's a sort of a half uh, a systole, half diastole uh, index, which worked very well in patients who had amyloid disease, who have both systolic and diastolic disturbances, where uh, Dr. Troite originally described the indexes. And there are many of these indexes around and available. Here is another one which has seemed to become prominent uh, recently in a variety of techniques, the systolic, diastolic, or the filling, emptying uh, ratio. This is a filling and emptying ratio of the heart in normal. And this is, relates to heart rate, as I'll show you in a minute. But here's a patient uh, from a study that Dr. Mark Friedberg and I published which shows in a patient who's got bad uh, right ventricular dysfunction uh, with a hyperplastic left heart syndrome, how diastole is remarkably shortened compared to the systolic relationship. And uh, uh, you can do the Tay index by M mode if you want to. It really makes little difference. It's all a period in, in, in uh, interval, and uh, you just have to make sure that the heart rate remains constant during the time. So the difference between the Tay index and the SD ratio uh, in interval is uh, that um, in, in the one, the um, isovolumic contraction time uh, and relaxation time are part of the equation, whereas here it's really only systole and diastole, inflow only. Um, what happened to ultrasound uh, from M mode and Doppler is it then moved out into the two-dimensional area, which there have been a variety of techniques uh, used. Dr. Sanders is going to talk about that, and I'm not going to talk any further than that. I just want to finish off by talking a little bit about color Doppler and the physics of color Doppler that have become so important for us to understand. And of course, uh, velocity uh, related to this Nyquist limit, which is twice the pulse repetition frequency allows us to look at things like flow velocity, we can see proximal acceleration, we can see disorder, uh, we can see uh, flow direction. 
So the Nyquist limit, as I said, is half the pulse repetition frequency ratio. And now, because in an ultrasound scanner, you can only, uh, uh, in, under the ideal circumstance, uh, everything is, uh, is equal. But if you want to look at, example, for frame rate or the scan line density or the depth and the width or the frequency resolution, you have to make a compromise uh, of, of one or the other to get this. So, for example, if you want to look at the frequency resolution, your line density, the frame rate, and the depth of resolution will all be compromised. And so uh, you have to remember that when you do these things, that this is uh, what you're look, looking at when you do an ultrasound study. Um, the uh, Doppler here, for example, is shown as a standard scale, the Nyquist scale, which reads at the point of aliasing the velocity 23 or 13 millimeters. But really, it should have been written like this because really what it is is a, um, um, a wheel that goes round and round. And so when you get aliasing, it just goes round and round again. So um, although the scale is written as a linear scale, it's really a circular phenomenon related to how fast the sound is traveling. And because in a jet, the sound velocities are so high that you can't make any of the measurements on the way that we do it. We look at what we call the proximal isovelocity surface acceleration, or PISA. And PISA is best described as we look at um, a cross-sectional area here, as as the blood is traveling towards the jet, it increases its rate of travel faster and faster and faster. Okay, And if we look at it from the side here, this is what it looks like. So all the blood is traveling on an isovelocity of a hemisphere towards the central point where the jet is. And you can see here at the boundary of the first alias, 27 centimeters per second, you have it here, and 54 here. Now because the Nyquist limit, or flow, is related to 2 pi r squared times the Nyquist limit times 60, because it's an average, over 1,000, which brings it to uh, system international liters per minute. Um, as the, the, um, the alias boundary goes, that the radius to the boundary, uh, will, as, as the sound goes down, so the, the radius goes up, so it's a, a constant. So it really doesn't make any difference how you uh, do the calculation. But really, it's basically at the boundary of the first alias, where the blood travels the first time where it travels, where it changes its direction, and you read it over here at 27 centimeters per second as it's coming towards you here. And uh, that's just uh, simply a color uh, velocity uh, showing the same thing in terms of a color aliasing. And you can see how the, the, the Nyquist limit increases in bands as it goes towards the level, and uh, the level is lowest here at 38 centimeters, and this is, uh, is um, double, treble, and quadruple this level. And as you can see, as this goes down, so the radius uh, goes down, so the product is always the same. And here's an example of a free jet for you. Um, this is actually a picture of a baby in utero uh, passing urine. And I was lucky enough uh, during the study to be able to get it. And you can see here very clearly what a free jet looks like. Uh, here, a free jet is one is not confined by, by, by the chambers, okay, or by pressure. That's what a free jet is, and the amniotic pressure pretty close to zero, uh, and so there's no uh, real influence on this. And you can see it's got a cone-shaped velocity. There's areas where there's entrainment of, of uh, matter, material, particles, whatever, into the, um, the, the flame, and then it decreases, and then... Um, theoretically, if it was in a vessel, would relaminate uh, the amount of flow. This is the umbilical vessels uh, just by the side, traveling at the same velocity. And I think that's one of the important issues that we have to consider in terms of ultrasound, because here's the orifice area here uh, in a free jet. But if you have a wall here, then the pressure will change across the wall, and the and the 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 um, the, the um, jet will change its dimension from being like a perfect ice cream cone to being flattened. And once it hits the wall, it will never un, uh, come from the wall. And that's called the Coanda effect, uh, which we all understand from uh, uh, supravalvar aortic stenosis as the perfect example. But you can see here 
here's a free jet. If you put in a little plate, you can see how the uh, plate alters the shape of the jet, and you can see uh, what happens here with the entrainment. And here's a wall jet that came off the tricuspid valve and hugged the wall of the atrium. So we see that all the time. Okay, well, I've explained that, uh, I think, here very clearly as well with the plate and how the, uh, the, the, the signal looks very different. So then if you evaluate a jet in one dimension, you may get a very wrong idea when it's a wall-hugging jet as to what it looks like. Now, not only does the jet change its uh, size, but it changes also the size in terms of the receiving pressure. So, for example, um, here, let's just say, for example, this patient has got a very high left atrial pressure, just uh, from the model. And you see, of course, that the jet is much smaller than when the pressure is lower. So, also, you have to understand that when you look at a jet, you also have to understand what the, um, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the pressure is into which the jet is being ejected. So, in, in other words, if you look at a tricuspid jet and a mitral jet, and they look the same. The mitral jet is going to be more severe because left atrial pressure is generally higher than right atrial pressure. So you have to always make these considerations when thinking of a color jet. Also, what is the size of the volume? As the, as the chamber volume increases in size, it also has an effect on the jet. And here's one at 110 with a nice big jet. And down here at 150 ml, when the, you have a sort of, in this example, a big left atrium, the jet actually looks like it's smaller. It's the same volume of regurgitation, but the jet uh, size uh, doesn't uh, yield for you the accurate estimation. And these are some of the things that you have to consider in terms of color uh, Doppler. Additionally, we can look at the jet. This is a change of the jet with a Nyquist limit held at 61 centimeters per second and various different kinds of uh, processing of the jet, which yield actually pretty much the same information until you get down to this one over here. So really you have to watch out for what, how you must always evaluate things with a standard jet from your own jet physics. Okay, and now if you change the Nyquist limit, you can see here's a beautiful jet, and as you lower the Nyquist limit down here from 61 to 39 to 23 to 17, you get remarkable changes. Now, in the example, in this example here, it, it is a big problem. But if you, uh, because uh, it doesn't seem to have any advantage. But when you're dealing with low velocity signals, you may get a much better um, signal by changing the scale or the Nyquist limit on your colored Doppler to see how you get it. Just, uh, this is a, an example of a radial artery. And um, here we would say flow is going in the opposite directions. Well, it is, but flow is continuously running in the same direction because, as we know from the Doppler equation, at the, when you're exactly at 90 degrees, there's no signal. So you have to think that you can see a signal that has got two colors in it that is maybe arising from a constant chamber size. And the other thing about flow is flow may um, vary in the way it comes, it doesn't generally run in this direction, but flow spirals in the vascular system. So you have to look at what, you, what you're doing. You can change wall filters and you can see different areas within the wall filters and also the gain uh, and frequency signals will affect how you look at color Doppler. And um, the, one of the things that you have to do is make sure that the Doppler um, doesn't bleed out of the vessel surface or that you don't under gain the Doppler when you'll see nothing. So you have to get an ideal gain to the system and uh, the, you really have to set this up uh, as you look at a color system. So that's what I've got to say. Now we can listen to what Dr. Sanders is going to tell us about uh, two-dimensional Doppler physics. <laughs> 
I'm glad to see everyone here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 2D Echo, and I may also just give a little more conceptual approach to, to uh, Doppler, not the clinical part that Dr. Silverman's already shown you, but just a little bit of a, an approach to the idea of why Doppler does what it does. So as you heard, um, two-dimensional echo is really, you can think of it as being single crystal echo or M-mode echo, where one sweeps the beam back and forth uh, in order to obtain a two-dimensional image or a sectional image. Uh, and this can be done in a number of ways. Originally, it was done literally by moving the transducer with a motor. Uh, the, the, um, some of the original uh, equipment actually had a motor that moved an M-mode transducer back and forth, and you could obtain multiple lines uh, of M-mode data across uh, a sectional image and produce uh, an image by interpolating uh, between the lines to create uh, the image. This was generally not used anymore. This was uh, m many of the f original two-dimensional uh, e imagers used this technology, but this has pretty much gone by the wayside, and now what we use is called array technology. And what this means is that there uh, are a number of transducers with transducer elements within uh, the transducer that you use when you take the two-dimensional transducer that you put on someone's chest there are really uh, a large number of elements within this arranged in a linear array, hence the term linear array technology. Uh, now there could be as many as 128 elements. Uh, that's sort of typical now for most transducers. It started out uh, at 32 and then 64 and 128, and sometimes there are in longer linear array transducers, there may be even more than that. But typically for cardiac use, we would use about 128 elements. And each of these elements uh, is a transducer like the transducers that Dr. Silverman was telling you about that have characteristics of a <clears throat> near field, far field, focal zone, uh, all of the other things. The interesting thing about this, and one, one can think about what happens in, in beam forming or, or uh, forming the ultrasound beam, is that all of the little wavelets, if you will, made by each of these transducers because of constructive and destructive interference uh, actually meld together to form a single ultrasound beam. Uh, and that's really what happens in, in phased array technology. Each of these little transducers is activated. Each one produces uh, a little uh, ultrasound wavelet, if you will, and all of these wavelets then, uh, because of interference patterns that develop uh, out in the field, create uh, a beam. Now you can do a number of things with that beam. Uh, if you change the firing order, if you don't fire them all at the same time or activate each of these transducers at the same time, but do it sequentially, for example, like I've shown up here, then the leading edge on the top is ahead of the leading edge on the bottom and you get a different interference pattern. And in fact, what that basically does is angle the beam off to one side. You could do it the other way as well, or if you do it in an order like this where you fire uh, the edges first and the middle ones later, you can focus the beam and get, get a beam focusing. And this is largely how ultrasound beams are, are focused now. And if you do some combination thereof, you can, you can angle the beam as well as focusing it. And that's how you sweep the beam across by changing the order in which the transducer elements are fired, then you can make the beam scan across and create a two-dimensional image that's analogous to taking a motor and driving a single crystal across uh, and doing the same thing. So that's basically how 2D images uh, are created. Now, <clears throat> you can focus the outgoing ultrasound beam like we talked about there by adjusting the way the elements are activated. And also by putting a lens like Dr. Silverman showed you before for a single crystal in front of the whole array to focus in the off-axis beam width. So you can, you can use that technology, but now what's used um, to really focus uh, the sound beam is what's called receive focusing. 
And this is sort of like what you do with a camera. You focus not the light waves that go out and bounce off the object and come back to you, but you focus when it comes back into the camera by adjusting the lens. And you can do the same thing with an ultrasound transducer by adjusting when the various elements of the transducer are active uh, to, to create the incoming beam uh, that actually creates the image. So you can focus both the outgoing sound beam, which gives you sort of a general range of focused sound, and then you can focus on the receive as well, which markedly improves the image and greatly increases the length of the useful zone or the focused zone uh, as it's coming back in. And the way this is done <clears throat> is once the ultrasound uh, is created and is moving out into the field, it will begin to come back to the ultrasound transducer as it reflects off of structures out in the field, uh, interfaces between materials of different acoustic density. And so when it comes back, <clears throat> very early on, you can activate just a few crystals in the middle, and so you can focus the beam in this area up here. And then with a little bit later, as sound is coming back a little bit further uh, in the field, you can add crystals that are active on the receive, and so focus it a little further away and a little further away. And by continuing to change how many elements are active on the receive, one can then focus the incoming sound beam just like adjusting the lens on a camera to focus the light that's coming back into the camera. And this is done automatically. This isn't something that you have to do. Uh, I'm just explaining this because it's important to know how ultrasound machines work. So this is something that's built into virtually every cardiac ultrasound machine uh, and something you don't have to think about and do. It, the, the machine just does it for you. Uh, it will change the receive characteristics of the transducer over the few microseconds that ultrasound takes to, to go to your field of interest and come back uh, into the transducer. So this is how dynamic receive focusing occurs now. And we, as we said, you can also <clears throat> focus the, the ultrasound beam. Focusing is done both uh, in the plane of the, uh, of the array this way using uh, the technology that I told you before of changing the order in which the transducer elements are fired. But <clears throat> the off-axis, the, the other dimension, this is a three-dimensional beam that's going out, so we can focus uh, this way. And then uh, <clears throat> you can focus in the other dimension using an acoustic lens which is placed on the surface. You don't see this, but it's placed on the surface of the transducer, uh, and that focuses in the off-axis. Uh, that is, in the uh, perpendicular to the plane of the image that you're seeing, to thin the slice a little bit, so that you don't get a very thick slice and get a lot of structures that you don't realize are, uh, are actually in the section that you're, you're getting. This way, you can have a much thinner slice and uh, improve the, the resolution that way. So there's focusing in both directions. <clears throat> now, axial resolution, there are two <clears throat> characteristics of the uh, image quality that are, that are important for um, describing and determining image quality. One of them is axial resolution. And what that means is the ability of the ultrasound to distinguish two structures that are <clears throat> closely spaced along the ultrasound how far apart the structures have to be along the plane of the ultrasound beam uh, in order to be distinguished. And as Dr. Silverman told you, this is determined largely by the spatial pulse length. And <clears throat> so if, if this is a cartoon of a transducer, <clears throat> we have damping material here and the transducer element here uh, in, the, in the face. And this, this would hold for multiple elements. I'm just showing you in one element here just for simplicity, but this would, this would uh, be the same if we had multiple elements here. I do not understand why the pointers don't stay, but they don't. Anyway, <clears throat> so the transducer is activated with an electrical signal that's produced by the machine, uh, and <clears throat> it begins to vibrate, uh, which is what it does to make ultrasound energy. Ah, okay. 
Oh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. So as the transducer begins to vibrate, most systems now are, are what are called critically damped. Uh, in other words, there's a <clears throat> damping material here connected to the transducer that as soon as the transducer begins to ring, uh, the damping material will stop it. It's like you struck a bell and immediately grasped it with your fingers to keep it from ringing for very long. And so we want the <clears throat> ultrasound transducer to make a very small uh, pulse of ultrasound energy, a very short pulse. Usually it's in the range of two to three cycles, which is about the least uh, that you can have the, the transducer make. <clears throat> and so the length of this pulse is what determines the axial resolution. And so <clears throat> the, the spatial pulse length is a function of the wavelength, uh, which is the inverse of the frequency. The higher the frequency a transducer, the lower the wavelength, the shorter the wavelength. So if you had a 5 megahertz transducer versus a 10 megahertz transducer, you'd have half the wavelength. Uh, in a 10 megahertz versus a 5 megahertz. And so <clears throat> the length of this ultrasound pulse is a function of the wavelength and the number of waves that you have. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, the better the axial resolution of the transducer. Okay? And also the better damped the transducer is, the fewer cycles it sends out, the fewer waves <clears throat> that it sends out, also the shorter the pulse length and the better the axial resolution. All of these things are not settings that you can modify on the machine. This is the way the machine just works and <clears throat> the damping material is there, it's, it's effective, it does what it's supposed to do and you don't have to worry about that but just so you understand uh, particularly the influence of frequency of the transducer on axial resolution. Higher frequency transducers produce better axial resolution. Dr. Silverman was giving you some numbers for uh, the sub-millimeter resolution that we can achieve now with most ultrasound machines. And this just gives you <clears throat> an idea of the wavelength uh, of a given frequency transducer. These are sort of typical frequencies that we might use for uh, cardiac use. A seven and a half megahertz transducer, for example, has a wavelength of about 0.2 millimeters. So the uh, axial resolution is a function of ever how many waves go out, if there are usually about two, so then you would have a resolution of about 0.4 uh, millimeters, so less than half a millimeter with that kind, and, and less than probably three, yikes, less than three-tenths of a millimeter with a 10 megahertz transducer. <clears throat> so here's the, the concept uh, of this, is that the pulse length has to be able to completely uh, finish being reflected by the first structure that you want to resolve from the second structure. Say these are two structures in your field of view that you want to be able to resolve. The pulse has to completely finish reflecting off the first reflector before any of the reflected pulse from the second one comes back uh, and overlaps the first one, as you see here. If the pulse length is too long, <clears throat> longer than um, uh, twice the distance, or, or shorter than twice the distance of the spatial pulse length, uh, then you get overlap between the two pulses and it looks like there's just one long structure there, whereas if it's short enough, you'll have a little gap in between, you'll, ultrasound will finish reflecting from the first one before any of the ultrasound reflected from the second one comes back to this locus. Does that make sense? And so you'll have a little gap in here between the two signals as they come back from the area and it will be displayed as two separate structures, whereas if the spatial pulse length is too long, uh, longer than um, half the, uh, the distance between, then you'll have overlap uh, and you won't be able to resolve them as two separate structures. And the other determinant of image quality really is lateral resolution, particularly this is with um, <clears throat> two-dimensional imaging, this is particularly important. And this is the ability to discriminate closely spaced structures in the field of view, perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. And that's really determined by the beam width. The beam has to be able to pass 
conceptually between the two structures so that at some point uh, from, this dist from this spatial distance away from the transducer, there's no ultrasound energy returning back to the transducer. In that way, you can separate these as two discrete objects. So the beam width is, a, is the major uh, determinant of, sp of, of um, lateral resolution uh, in ultrasound. And this is achieved by focusing the beam. So this is the whole purpose of, of using the focusing technology that we talked about before. Uh, you want to make the beam width as narrow as possible in order to improve the lateral resolution ability of the transducer. If it's too wide and there's always part of the beam overlapping one or the other structures, then there's always sound energy coming back from that depth and the machine can't distinguish these as two separate objects. They look like a single larger object to the machine. So the major determinants then of image quality are the frequency of the transducer, the aperture width, which we'll talk about, that's just the, the width of the transducer itself, the face of the transducer, the number of elements in the transducer, and the element spacing in the transducer. So <clears throat> if we look at uh, the effect of frequency, as we said before, a higher frequency transducer uh, produces uh, better both axial and uh, lateral resolution. We talked about the reason for axial resolution because it shortens the spatial pulse length. And for lateral resolution, uh, a higher frequency transducer has a longer near field and it also has the capacity to be focused to a smaller beam width. So higher frequency transducers then for those reasons produce both better uh, axial resolution and better lateral resolution. Also the aperture width, a wider transducer face <coughs> lengthens the near field so it gives you more opportunity for focusing the, the beam and it also permits a smaller beam diameter. It seems paradoxical but uh, in fact a wider transducer face allows you to focus the beam <coughs> to a smaller diameter just because of the characteristics that occur with interference at the lateral boundary of the beam edge. Uh, and so you, can, you have a longer near field and a more narrow beam diameter with a wider aperture. And then the number of elements is really just the same concept as any digital process. The more steps you can break something up into, uh, the finer uh, the resolution is. Uh, and the same thing here, the more elements you have, the fewer or the more uh, little wavelets that are produced uh, and the finer the ability to adjust the beam uh, out here in the field, to focus the beam to do uh, other adjustments to it. Fewer elements obviously makes the adjustments coarser. There, there are fewer elements with which to, to make adjustments and so you get a coarser effect uh, with fewer elements. So you would like to have more elements in the transducer, which is why it went progressively up to 68, uh, 64 to 128 elements. It's actually very difficult to cut elements that fine. Uh, it, it's really uh, the, the mortality rate for transducers is actually quite high uh, when trying to cut elements and particularly what uh, Dr. Shirali will talk about in a little bit uh, about uh, two-dimensional phased transducers where there's actually not just a single line of transducers but actually a block uh, that has transducers in both directions. Trying to cut that uh, into a very fine transducer uh, array is really very difficult and the, the mortality of transducers there is quite high. And then the element spacing is also important and again this is a, a technically more of a challenge uh, of using, uh, making finer spacing between uh, the transducer elements uh, compared to uh, coarser spacing over here because what this does is it changes the angle between the main lobe of the ultrasound uh, beam uh, and other grating lobes or side lobes uh, that are sort of secondary lobes uh, of sound energy that are created by any uh, element, transducer uh, array of, of, of transducer elements here. And we would like this angle to be as large as possible because then this other ultrasound sort of goes off into never never land and doesn't come back to the transducer and contribute uh, to the image and can produce 
confusing artifacts in the image. So if the uh, side lobes or grating lobes are relatively close in angle to the main beam, then you get contamination from ultrasound coming back from these grating or side lobes and can contribute to artifacts uh, in the image. Uh, whereas we would like this angle to be uh, as large as possible and it's maximum at um, the wavelength over two spacing. So whatever the wavelength of the transducer that's being, pr being uh, created here, uh, half the wavelength spacing is where uh, this angle becomes maximal uh, and grating lobes go off into never never land and don't contribute to the image. So this is an example of a grating lobe artifact that you can see here uh, in a subxiphoid view. Here's the diaphragm down here, here's the ventricles up here, and here's this bright artifact over here on the side. That's what uh, this kind of artifact looks like. So <clears throat> the uh, important uh, concepts here are frequency, higher frequency transducers or produce shorter wavelengths and therefore better uh, resolution, both axial and uh, lateral resolution because of uh, the effects on the pulse length and on the beam width. Uh, the aperture or the size, the face of the transducer, a larger aperture uh, yields a longer focal zone and also a tighter focus, so this improves resolution. The element number, more elements you have, the more accurate the phasing, uh, like any kind of digital process that you would think of. Uh, and element spacing, the finer the spacing, uh, the lower the chance of having grating lobe artifacts and other kinds of artifacts from the transducer. So that's about it for two-dimensional imaging. Um, sort of some general concepts of imaging. Um, all signals coming back to the machine have to be amplified because the Ultrasound energy is really a very low amplitude wave, very low amplitude signal as it's coming back in. So everything goes through an amplifier. Uh, the way that ultrasound is amplified is a little unusual. Uh, it's not a uniform amplification like you might use for sound, say if you were setting up a, um, to, to transmit uh, a rock band or something like that. In fact, what we want uh, is to have relatively uniform voltage out, and we know that there's attenuation of the ultrasound signal as it goes further and further into tissue. Uh, there's a, a essentially a, um, an exponential decline in the energy content of the, of the beam as it goes further and further because of various processes that uh, uh, Dr. Silverman talked about earlier. So we want to have very little amplification in the near field here and much more amplification as we go further and further out. And that's what the gain pots, the slide pots that uh, are on the machine do for you, is allow you to set up the amplification scheme in such a way to uniformize uh, the image as it's coming back in. Otherwise, you get a very bright image in the near field and a very dark image in the far field. Uh, and in order to avoid that, uh, this scheme of uh, differential amplification uh, has been developed, and that's, that's why you generally set up the little slide pots like this so that there's more amplification in the far field uh, than in the near field. And then you can also set up a thresholding or reject phenomenon to sort of clear out some of the noise, out of, particularly out of the chamber. Uh, you can reject low-level signals here that would just contribute a little bit of noise uh, to the chamber. Uh, and you can change the post-processing, the way the uh, the signal is actually displayed uh, on the monitor. Uh, <clears throat> because if you use a linear uh, display uh, strategy, then the grayscale on the monitor and the signal intensity are just uh, linearly related to each other. But we're generally not very interested in either very high level or very low level signals because they don't really contribute much information we're much more interested in signals here in the middle. And so what we do is flatten out both ends of the curve so that we're using most of our grayscale uh, on the monitor here in the middle where most of the information is. And so that's why uh, usually we use an S-shaped uh, curve uh, uh, for post-processing. Because <clears throat> once you get above a certain level, uh, there's really not a lot of information content uh, in those signals. And the same thing here, once you get down into a very dark uh, 
uh, part of the image. There's not much information content there. It's mostly packed here in the middle, and so we want to use most of the monitor grayscale here in the middle where the information content is in the image. Hence the, the use of this kind of sigmoid curve uh, in, in uh, post-processing. Uh, and the other thing that's now available that used to not be is the thresholding used to be a, a reject uh, function where you would just lop off uh, low-lying signals down here, but you would also you lose this part of the monitor grayscale. Now with a compression um, technology, woo, uh, what can happen is you can reduce uh, the low-level signals here in the image, but still use the whole grayscale uh, of the monitor uh, simply by uh, reassigning uh, the, the monitor com compression to uh, a line over here, beginning not at the, at the, the very low-level signal that you have, but at some other level here that you can set using the, the thresholding knob on the machine. Uh, and so you still get the whole monitor grayscale to use uh, to display images, but you can get rid of uh, the low-level signals that you, that you don't need, that don't really contribute much to the image. Now, um, instead of using transducers that had a single modal frequency, uh, there's been a progression from this to uh, dual modal uh, transducers, and now most recently to broad bandwidth uh, transducers, so that now uh, transducers generally uh, transmit a whole band uh, of ultrasound information rather than having a, a much more fixed uh, central frequency. When I first started in this, things were uh, worked a little differently, and if you had a 5 megahertz transducer, it really did put out mostly 5 megahertz ultrasound with a little bit of scatter on either side. Now, transducers don't do that. Uh, you may have something that starts around 3 megahertz and ends around 8 megahertz or, or even... Uh, different, this is just an example, there are a lot of different um, um, types of transducers that are available that produce ultrasound over the whole range uh, that you see here. And then, <clears throat> just like you could focus the sound uh, beam on the return, you can also pick out different areas of this frequency range here to use in creating the image. You can use, you can concentrate on higher frequency uh, returning signals uh, to create the image that gives you a little better uh, resolution, a little sharper, crisper image. Or if you need more penetration, for example, you can concentrate on more uh, low frequency sound, which tends to uh, penetrate further and provide uh, more information on deeper structures. And this is, again, something that you can set uh, on the machine to, to change the uh, characteristic of the image from either concentrating on lower frequency or higher frequency or something that uh, is somewhere in the middle, uh, depending on what your needs are for, for the particular patient. And so basically the idea is it just changes the, the uh, scatter pattern, changes the, 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 the coarseness or the fineness of the grain in the image depending on whether you use higher or lower frequency uh, information. And um, the other thing to talk about a little bit is second harmonic imaging, which is uh, becoming uh, more and more important, uh, I think, particularly with a lot of our adult patients. This is turning out to be useful, uh, particularly uh, in that group of patients. And basically what uh, this does is transmits ultrasound at some frequency, but then receives at the second harmonic of that frequency. Um, and so you're looking at uh, sound energy that has changed its frequency. This is not exactly a Doppler effect. It's like uh, what the Doppler effect is, but it really isn't uh, exactly the Doppler effect. This is just something that can also happen with ultrasound energy as it interacts with, uh, with tissue. So you may transmit at three and then set your Trans, uh, transducer in your machine to really listen uh, mostly for 6 megahertz uh, energy returning to the transducer. And the reason for that, this was first discovered really with, uh, with um, contrast echo uh, because the uh, little bubbles uh, in contrast uh, tended to be of a size that uh, 
they were, th that the second harmonic uh, sound energy was uh, enhanced uh, compared to the uh, bass frequency. Uh, <clears throat> it it, it, it uh, has a, um, an attenuation that's really different. Rayleigh scattering, what, typically what happens with ultrasound and Rayleigh scattering is that once you send uh, the ultrasound out into tissue uh, and listen for it to come back, uh, it just drops off smoothly as a function of the frequency. But here that doesn't happen. You get a second harmonic bump uh, here in the scattering plot. So you not only get uh, returning sound from the fundamental, say the three megahertz that we were talking about, but at the second harmonic at six megahertz, you also get another bump, uh, which is not what Rayleigh scattering would predict, but it, it, it turns out to, to be the, the, the way the world works. Um, and, and as I say, this was discovered with uh, contrast, but it's also useful not with contrast. It turns out that, uh, that this can uh, be useful in, in patients who are rather difficult to image because of poor uh, echo windows. Um, it just turned out that, that that was discovered simply because of, of this phenomenon here. But um, it's, it, it's very good for looking at the endocardium. Um, and the mechanism of this is not totally clear, but what seems to happen is that ultrasound, as we said, is distorted by tissue. Uh, and one of the ways that it distorts the ultrasound is by generating harmonic overtones. Um, and most of the energy, it turns out, is in the second harmonic. And so uh, you can get uh, tissue-induced uh, distortion or this creation of second harmonics uh, and improve the resolution in a lot of patients who are otherwise difficult. And the, the interesting thing, and one of the reasons that it, that it does improve imaging, is that the second harmonic beam profile is very square. You don't have a lot of drop-off. You don't have um, uh, a, you know, a, a broad sort of uh, typical bell-shaped curve uh, of the beam profile. You have a very square beam profile, so most of the energy comes back where you want it uh, and produces a little bit uh, better Im uh, image. And you don't have much in the way of side lobes, so it gets rid of a lot of artifact that we see uh, in adult patients. So this can be uh, very useful. Second harmonic imaging can be quite useful in patients like that. Dr. Silverman's already talked about Doppler, so we won't go uh, into that. So who's up next? Yersh. Thank you very much. That's right. And so when you uh, take a, a signal and you take it from the second of one, you get rid of a lot of the noise. So I think you showed that with the great artifact. Yeah, that's... Right. right. You, you, have, you have much less uh, contribution from grading lobes, and you also have a much squarer beam profile, right. uh, as we talked about. Let's make sure we're doing okay here. Well, QLab is over here, but here we go again. For the life of me, so right, right. This is uh, I'm not sure how this is not reducing. Good morning, everybody. It's just going to take me a few minutes to, to get this. Uh, to get this thing up here. OK, here we go again. OK. So where's my? 
Where are these? Okay. So, what things are these? I'm making the flames. All right. Yeah. Is it bothering something? Yes, if you could just wait. Okay, I'll just turn it off. Okay, good morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about 3D imaging technology. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, a little bit about the background of, uh, uh, of the transducers and, and, and how that has all evolved. Uh, and then I'm going to very quickly give you some examples of, uh, of how um, the heart actually looks compared to how we see it by 2D echo compared to how we see it by 3D echo. The first two talks that you heard are really the foundation of the entire next four days. Um, the other technologies that, uh, that we talk about, whether, uh, you know, whether it's uh, MRI or assessment of function or 3D imaging, those are, if you're, sort of, if you're planning um, building a house, uh, those are foundation talks, and then the rest of these are like, uh, you know, uh, deciding on the color of the paint in the rooms or something like that. Um, so, uh, so the components of the echo machine are uh, that that matter to us. Uh, if we just take all the uh, sort of, if you just reduce it down to minimal list uh, approach, the first thing that you need for the echo machine is a transducer, because that's responsible for um, acquiring your image. Uh, the next thing you need is the machine with its hardware and its software to help process the image. Um, so that's your image processing for you. And then the third part uh, is the display. Now, there have been tra uh, there's been an evolution in all of these three uh, aspects that, uh, that, uh, that has really helped out with, uh, with advancing the field of, uh, of imaging. Um, in terms of sort of the bottom line, what do we deal with when we do an echo, whether it's a 2D echo or a 3D echo, we're really talking about a user interface. That's, that's you know, what do you do? What do you have to actually do uh, to, to get the images? And um, um, since 3D is new, um, I'm going to be spending most of my talks over the next four days really just sort of showing you how we manipulate the user interface to develop 3D images. Okay. So in the past 3D um, acquisition, started with freehand scanning. So what that meant was that you started your acquisition at the beginning of a sweep, and then you did the sweep yourself, and the whole, it was a bunch of 2D slices that were acquired, and, uh, uh, you know, and then they were stored on a uh, floppy disk, actually, uh, and then transported to a, to a machine, like the TomTech machine. Um, and uh, I remember being involved in these early on where uh, you started the processing of the images in the evening and then left because it was going to take all night for the thing to process the images for you. And then when you came back the next morning, sometimes there was an error and the whole thing had not worked out at all. And if you're really lucky, you got to see something fuzzy. Now, of course, Dr. Sanders and Silverman will say that, that what we see with 3D Echo is still fuzzy today, but that's a different story. Uh, it's more sophisticated fuzzy now. So, we started out with freehand scanning, and then we began, went to something called uh, mechanical scanning. Uh, and what mechanical scanning was, was um, uh, some of you may remember this. It's, it's like a transesophageal echo type of a control. Uh, it was a, an arm on a transthoracic echo device, on a transducer. And so you had to hold this on the chest, and what it did was it would rotate the plane of the image by three degrees or two degrees. 
and then it would acquire one full cardiac cycle at each at each of such acquisition at each uh, uh, angle you see so over 180 degrees that might be 60 different heartbeats that it had to acquire uh, and then it had to stack all of that and then ECG um, you know uh, align it and so on so it was a lot of work a lot of offline work and at a time when echo when when computing was was slow and so it took a lot of time and when things take time at least in America we, people lose patience they don't we don't have patience we want quick results uh, um, so it was actually a group of uh, folks at Duke that came out with the first 3D matrix uh, phased array transducer. Uh, and, and what is meant by this is, uh, is, that, the, uh, is that the elements are, are arranged in a, in a rectangle. So this was the first uh, sort of matrix array. Um, it, it was uh, the, the, the transducer head was about as big as an orange. Uh, so it's a pretty large footprint. Uh, it did not really fit into an intercostal space or anything like that. It was what was called sparse array because at the time there were not that many elements that could be put on there. So they had a few elements um, and then what happened in between those was interpolation of data. And even with all of that we still had very poor frame rates like two to five frames, two to five volumes per second which is really not good for trying to image something that's moving really fast like a child's heart. So it worked for maybe these ventricles, but not for those ventricles. Um, but at least it was sort of a start anyway. So there have been three advances uh, in terms of the image. The first is computer, uh, min miniaturization of, uh, of, uh, of computing technology. The second is advances in piezoelectrics, which are the material, the f basic material that, uh, that is responsible for generation of ultrasound. Uh, and then the third is the display. Um, so um, this is a, an IBM mainframe computer uh, from the 1960s. So all of that computing power, this is, um, this is uh, Moore's law, which basically says that um, uh, every, every two years, the amount of uh, energy, um, uh, amount of the number of transducers that can be fit on a board doubles. Uh, and all of that computing energy uh, could be fit on this little thing in Steve Jobs' hand and you can see from the way he looks and the fact that he was alive at this time that this was a while back. It's, it's even more ridiculous now. Um, and, um, and so uh, unsurprisingly, 3D uh, Echo has, uh, has evolved to uh, sort of real-time uh, imaging, both by transthoracic and transesophageal uh, modalities. So here we go with the transthoracic transducer. There's a material at the end of the transducer, not the orange thing or whatever it is, that's the insulation part, but behind that there's, some, there's a layer of stuff that's called piezoelectric material, and that's the thing that fundamentally determines the quality of your ultrasound image. So let's say you've got a heart over there, so the piezoelectric material is responsible for converting electrical energy into ultrasound energy and then taking that ultrasound energy back and then converting it into electrical signals that the, that the machine can then work with. Okay. Um, so, and that's how you get your image. So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is what, this, what the material actually does. So, at the bottom of this picture is, um, is what we call uh, sort of a, a conventional ultrasound um, piezoelectric material. And, and what is supposed to happen is um, when you apply an electrical impulse and you take that impulse away, the crystals are supposed to align in the same direction. Um, that material that is used for piezoelectrics, until the new sort of uh, pure wave single crystal technology came along, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, the best that could be achieved was when you, despite the fact that you want 100% of the crystals to align correctly, all that could be achieved was about 70%. Um, so the crystals, you can see by the vectors that are drawn there, uh, that the crystals were all over the place, you know, about 70%. And, and uh, uh, this is sort of conventional, um, conventional uh, piezoelectrics. So it gives you about 70% polarization. What that gives you is um, the potential for more noise in the system. You know, signal and now, you know, your, your signal gets, gets, uh, gets corrupted with, uh, with noise. Um, the new material is, um, is a single crystal. And the way that, um, the way that it is uh, made is, if you, think, if you sort of think about how they generated old piezoelectrics, that material was unchanged since the 19... 40s. Uh, 
and what they would do is they would mix up various things and bake them all right and and then when the thing when the baked stuff cooled down uh, that's that's what they used to uh, to make the crystal um, the new stuff they basically melt it all together and then they pull out uh, at a very very slow speed they pull out an ultra pull out a, uh, you know the, the the material in a manner that it, it has to solidify from the molten stuff, kind of like glass, actually, if you think about it. You know, it's being pulled out slowly. It can't break. If it breaks, uh, the process has to be restarted. So you end up with a single crystal that fits at the end of the transducer. Uh, and that crystal is then cut into 3,000 elements. So we talked about 2D transducers that have up to 128 elements. 3D transducers have... 3,000 such elements. Each of those um, elements is, is, uh, is able to be steered independently. It's able to be focused independently. Um, and the connections on those are as thin as a human hair. Um, it's, it's really remarkable to think that that much fits into a transesophageal probe. Um, so, uh, you know, leave alone a transthoracic. So these are square-shaped elements. They are identical sized, all of them and they're fully sampled and they're all independent, all right? Um, and the transducer itself contains circuit boards that do the fine steering of the, of the beam because some of that has to be done in the transducer and then the rest of it gets done inside the, the machine. So I'll go on to sort of practical applications of 3D imaging today. So the first one is live imaging. So what do you, what do you mean by live? Well, you put the transducer on the patient and you get an image. That's live imaging for you. Now with this, you get a very narrow wedge. So it's 90 degrees, which is the standard 2D image. You know, uh, looks like a, a slice of a pizza um, by about 23 degrees. That's approximate size. So it's 92 by 23, more or less. All right. So um, now we can use that as a live uh, modality. You can also zoom up inside a live 3D uh, image. Uh, and then the next kind, is, uh, is, is volumetric imaging, which um, basically volumetric imaging consists of a wide vo full volume, and, and, and that's ECG gated um, at the current time. So that requires, uh, that's a 90 by 90. Uh, you know, it's like four wedges of an orange that are stuck together. Um, and uh, that you can use that both with grayscale uh, and, with, uh, and with color flow. So we like live imaging for a lot in our lab. Um, you can use this for to do sweeps, just like you do 2D sweeps, you can do a 3D sweep. There are some real advantages with it, like you don't need an EKG. You don't need the patient to have regular heart rhythm. Otherwise, you uh, have to worry about things like breath holds and, uh, and, and artifacts and that kind of thing. The machine doesn't have to stitch uh, sub-volumes of 3D echo together, which is a real advantage. And the live images are easiest to understand when we are learning 3D uh, echo. Um, it's also more applicable for um, important things in the cat lab. When you're trying to guide interventions like ASD closure, that kind of thing, you can have live imaging to show you that. So here are, um, here, here are some pathology pictures of a mitral valve looking at it from above and from below. So in this picture to your uh, left, um, this one shows the mitral valve looking at it from above. So what we've done here is we've cut off the, these are not 3D echo, these are actual pathology specimens. Uh, uh, I mean, it's good, but it's not that good. Um, so we've cut off the top of the heart and we're looking down, all right? So this is the plane of the atrial septum. This is the aortic valve over here that is wedged between the, um, between the two uh, AV valves, the mitral valve here, the tricuspid valve here. So I'm just going to give you an analogy of, of sort of what the, just an example of what the, what the mitral valve normally looks like. So this is a, a P1, P2, and P3. Uh, this is a, the nomenclature that the adult folks use. They are very good with the mitral valve. It's easy for adult folks. I hope there are no adult folks in here. But uh, it's easy for them because they don't deal with too many structures. So, so the ones that they deal with, they, they really analyze them very well. So... The mitral valve has a, a lateral commissure, has a medial commissure, and it has the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve typically has three scallops, not always, and they are named from left to right, P1, P2, P3, and then the opposing part, apposing part of the anterior leaflet are called A1, A2, and A3, all right? 
So that is the A1, A2 and A3 there. If you look at this valve from below, then, then that is what it looks like. So there are two papillary muscles, leaflet cord from both sides insert to both papillary muscles, lateral commissure, medial commissure, A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3, something along uh, those lines. So now um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, show you what uh, what this looks like by uh, by 3D imaging. I think we have a problem with our uh, with our uh, resolution again, Norm. Looks like yeah. Let's try that again, but that's uh, that's not the way <laughs> that's not quite the way we want it to look, but. Maybe maybe I'll just deal with this for right now. So, but I, I um, well, so yeah, I probably should resolve it, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about this. There's some there's a technical glitch with the with our um, system. Arrangement. Maybe should we do best, best for it in the display? Right. And then gather windows. Just make sure the arrangement looks good. We don't need yeah. to worry about this one. We want to do the VGI display. Yeah. You want to go to the VGI display. You, you yeah. can do it here. Yeah, here it is. No, no, it's gone again. Okay. VGI display. Okay. VGI. Okay. Mm -hmm. Scale. And then we were coming down. Was it, was it 800 by 600? I can try. I think it was the one there. It's either going to be too good or too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're probably just going to have to That's the other way. give Everybody up on this. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Scaled. Twelve, twelve we something, we, right? We, we, this one over here. Yeah. Twelve, eighty percent. Twelve, eighty percent. Confirm. Okay. Oh man. Did it go up higher? Yeah. I wonder if we should just stop. I can I can show my stuff later. Yeah. Let's just try this. Try it. Go up higher. Go to the. Uh, This one? 24, that one now. Let's try that. Confirm. Confirm. No. No, it's the other way. We'd have to reboot the whole thing. Yeah. Maybe we'll just go on to Mark's talk because this is going to take up time and it's not worth it. Okay? Sorry about this. Set it up yesterday, and we were pretty happy with it. But it's clearly not not quite ready. I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. And the sound controller is a significant issue here. Kind of pop up all the time. 
So good morning, everyone. And uh, my job in the uh, um, next few days is to talk about the functional aspects of the different lesions that we're going to talk about uh, over the course. And uh, Norman had asked me to emphasize uh, tissue Doppler and especially strain or deformation imaging in these talks. So that's what I'm going to do, but I don't think you can differentiate or separate that from the rest of the functional imaging, so we will uh, talk a little bit uh, about it. Uh, as Norman said, I'm from Toronto. I'm not a big sailor myself, but I had the opportunity this summer, which was a particularly beautiful uh, summer in Toronto, uh, to go sailing on Lake Ontario, and this is really what it looks like, even though this is an internet image. So let me just, before I start, ask who, who uses tissue Doppler or strain uh, in, their, in their work? Anyone? Two, three, very few people. Does anyone use it in research? No one. Okay, great. Maybe that will change by the end of the course. So um, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, introductory talk, you've heard about the Doppler techniques and about the 2D imaging techniques. So I'm not going to talk so much about those, but I'm going to talk what tissue Doppler strain and strain rate imaging are, how we acquire them, and some of their applications in congenital heart disease. And uh, Norman said in the first talk that these are the newer techniques. That's true, they're the newer techniques, but we have to realize that they're not so new anymore, and they've been around for between 10 and 20 years, depending on what technique you're talking about. And I think one of the reasons that only three people here use it, but they've already been around for 10 to 20 years, attest to some of the problems we have with these techniques. Nonetheless, they've given us some important insights, and I think one of the advantages that they've given us is that they allow us to measure regional function. So looking at different segments in the heart, something that wasn't easy to do non-invasively, uh, bedside, uh, in the live uh, patient. Now if we're talking about cardiovascular function, let's start from a few, uh, let's start from a few definitions uh, of function. If you're looking at the system as a whole, cardiovascular function can just mean the ability of the heart to meet the, uh, the ability of the heart to meet the body supply in terms of oxygen and in terms of uh, blood. Uh, if you're looking at a hemodynamic uh, definition of function and you look at the heart as a pump, the function is the ability of the heart to produce enough pressure, uh, perfusion pressure or stroke volume, and to fill under adequately uh, low pressures. And then if we're talking about strain imaging or myocardial function, basically, if we're just looking at the myocardium, its ability to lengthen and shorten in order to generate force and then in order to relax, to reduce the force and to fill. So whatever level we look at, whether we're looking at the myofiber, whether we're looking at the regional myocardium, or whether we're looking at the pump as a whole, the heart as a whole, there are two basic important components. And the one is the ability to generate force over here, and then the ability to deform or to change length, to change dimension, to change shape. And the, basically, the heart develops force to overcome the, uh, to overcome the resistance to open the valves and then uh, to supply blood, and then deforms to actually eject the blood to produce the stroke volume. So if you look at the fiber, the fiber develops uh, its force and then shortens. The myocardium develops stress and shortens. And the ventricle develops pressure and then shortens or contracts and then fills. Now in clinical cardiology, we've mostly used these global indices, and that's what we mostly still use today, ejection fraction, fractional shortening, uh, to look at the heart as a pump. And what we do in uh, deformation imaging or strain imaging is we look at the myocardium more directly and how the myocardium shortens and lengthens or thickens and thins depending on what direction we're looking. And we do that because partly what we're trying to see is how that reflects on the myofiber shortening. We cannot do that directly. We do not have a technique available to look at the myofibers or the myocytes, but the way the muscle contracts is in part related to how the myocytes uh, contract. And that's demonstrated in the slide here 
where uh, on this side you can see the uh, sarcomere length and its stress that it develops, so the force and the change in length. And here is strain imaging, circumferential strain, again the wall stress developed and the shortening uh, of, the, of the muscle. So uh, myocardial contraction reflects myocyte contraction, even though there's obviously influenced by other factors and it's not a direct uh, relationship. And so this uh, level, uh, the levels of different interactions in the heart is shown in the actin-myosin or sarcomere uh, interaction over there. The myocytes are organized in aggregates in a certain orientation in the heart, and that contributes to the complex motion of the heart in three dimensions. And then the ejection or the function of the heart, the performance of the heart, are influenced by additional factors that are critical to cardiac function and in fact will be most of what I talk about over the next few lectures, and that's preload and afterload, for instance. So preload is the initial stretch or the initial dimension of the myocytes, which then influence uh, their contraction, and the afterload is the resistance that the heart has to overcome uh, in order uh, to uh, eject. And you can also see that there's a twisting motion, which we'll get to in a few slides. But obviously, the function is influenced, and the boundary conditions, if you will, are influenced by many factors. We talk about the geometry of the chamber, uh, the thickness of the myocardium, the orientation of the uh, fibers, the loading effects that I just talked about, preload and afterload, the electrical activation and regional loading of the heart. It's not uniform over the whole ventricle. That affects the way the heart uh, performs. And then heart rate itself will affect uh, the, the contraction of the heart, mostly through what we call the force frequency relationship. The faster the heart rate, usually up to a certain point, the more vigorous the contraction of the heart through buildup uh, of calcium. Now, if we turn over to the ultrasound applications to start to measure this regional uh, function, we mainly talk about tissue uh, Doppler, either through a pulse tissue Doppler or color tissue Doppler to obtain tissue velocities, or strain imaging, which can be obtained from the tissue Doppler itself by measuring velocities in two different points and seeing the differential velocities between them, and from that one can assess how much the tissue has changed its length or has deformed, or from uh, speckle tracking, which is the more commonly used method today, where the ultrasound system uh, tracks the speckles, and I'll show you that uh, in a few slides' time over the cardiac cycle, and we can assess the thickening and thinning or, or shortening and lengthening of the myocardium, and we can do this in 2D or uh, in 3D. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of physics. Uh, there are differences in how these are obtained. Uh, pulsed and, and continuous Doppler used fast Fourier transforms to create the signal, the spectral signal that you see, whereas color tissue Doppler uh, uses autocorrelation, and one measures a phase shift, and these measure a frequency shift. Uh, but what I want to, you to take from this slide is that remember that color Doppler uh, in the tissue as well, and the principles here are exactly the same as blood Doppler, measure average velocities over an area. So they average those, the velocities you see in those pixels, and the average velocities are lower than the peak velocities. And, then, and in tissue Doppler, it works out to about 20 to 30 percent uh, lower, and that's important to remember. So here are examples of pulse tissue Doppler imaging. The uh, principles are exactly the same as blood imaging, except the filtering is different because these are low-velocity, high-frequency signals. We changed the filtering uh, that Norman and uh, uh, Steve Sanders talked about beforehand to uh, get rid of some of the blood uh, signals and focus on the tissue signals. Uh, and you can see that when you pulse uh, the tissue, uh, you get motion of the tissue, you get an isovolemic contraction peak over here during the QRS uh, signal, which you can see down below. It's this peak over here. You get a systolic wave and then an early and late diastolic wave, which really mirror uh, opposite to the uh, blood flow. If you're looking at the mitral valve, you get it opposite to the E and uh, in terms of direction, opposite to the blood flow E and A uh, velocities. And we have normal uh, values for pulse tissue Doppler. Uh, 
uh, in children. There are a number of papers out there. This is uh, one from Ben Idem. And again, all the normal data we have is for pulse tissue Doppler. So if you're doing research and you're commonly using color tissue Doppler, which I'll show you uh, in the next slide, the values are lower. And that's one of our problems. What are normal values? But in general, uh, values both in diastole and in systole increase across age uh, in children. So here's color tissue Doppler, uh, and it's very similar to color tissue, uh, color Doppler that you would use for uh, blood flow in terms of the, it's the same principles, it's the same technique. Uh, and this allows you to uh, sample larger regions of myocardium at once, so it's more practical because now I can acquire uh, one or two or three heartbeats, and then in post-processing, I can then sample any region in the acquired image. Obviously, there's going to be a trade-off uh, that Norman spoke about in terms of uh, how large your region of interest is and the frame rate that you're going to acquire, what speed you can sample at. But in general, we can acquire at quite high speeds with uh, color uh, tissue Doppler imaging, and then we can sample multiple areas of the myocardium at the same uh, time. Just as in blood uh, uh, flow Doppler, you can integrate the velocities to achieve displacement or the distance the blood has moved, you can do this in color tissue Doppler and you integrate the velocities to get displacement of the tissue. So how far has your region of interest moved over the cardiac cycle? And that's one of the measures of performance because uh, this is just displacement of the tissue as a measure of its longitudinal function, just the same way as in M mode you would do TAPSI, tricuspid annular planar systolic excursion, or mitral annular planar systolic excursion. This is the same uh, thing or gives you the same information. And there are other phenomena that we can see by Doppler. Uh, tissue Doppler, either pulsed or color, which is very difficult to see with the naked eye, but have functional importance. And here's a patient uh, that has uh, Alcapa, anomalous left coronary artery from the palmary artery, with a severely dysfunctional ventricle, even after repair of the lesion, with scar tissue. You can see the dilated ventricle. And if you pulse, uh, is, if you, sorry, if you sample at the uh, medial and lateral mitral annulus, you can see, first of all, that the velocities are very low, the function of this tissue is very low, uh, but also very abnormal. You can see that the lateral mitral annulus has a large peak after the aortic valve has closed. This is called post-systolic motion. This is a very inefficient ventricle, and you can understand that even if you've corrected the anatomical abnormality, how a ventricle like this can perpetuate its own dysfunction through very abnormal and an inefficient uh, contraction. So these are phenomena that's very difficult to detect with the naked eye looking at an ultrasound. And from Doppler, you can get other measures of uh, function, and here's one of them published uh, by my boss, Andrew Reddington, and Michael Vogel, who's here in Munich, um, and it's called isovolemic acceleration. And when you stimulate a myofiber, it first tenses, and so does the tissue. The tissue also tenses initially with the QRS uh, activation, and uh, it accelerates, and that's isovolemic acceleration. It happens very early in systole. The aortic valve is still closed. The tissue hasn't built up its force yet, uh, and so this is a relatively low independent measure of, uh, of function because both valves are closed. The mitral valve, the aortic valve, there's not much change in volume, in loading, and so this happens during the isovolemic period. Now, Matthias is just walking in, and I promised him yesterday that I would use his motorcycle as an example of function. So Matthias was telling me about his new motorcycle, and what he said to me without, we weren't talking about the heart at all, is that it's very powerful motorcycle, it accelerates in three seconds from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. Did I remember correctly, yes. Matthias? So what he used to describe the function of his motorcycle was acceleration, because that, it's the change in velocity over time, how much faster it gets over time. And so that is a very useful parameter of function because you understand that the engine of the motorcycle is powerful enough to accelerate that motorcycle very shortly. The same with tissue. That's why isovolemic acceleration may be useful because it describes the acceleration of the tissue during a period uh, that the volume of the ventricle is not uh, changing. And uh, Vogel and Reddington showed that you can change the loading conditions of the ventricle, you can decrease the preload, you can increase afterload, but the eyes of limic acceleration stays relatively simple. For, t for technical reasons, this really hasn't come to be a very 
uh, common clinical tool but useful uh, in research and useful to show another functional parameter called the force frequency relationship that I mentioned that when you increase heart rate up to a certain degree your contractility will increase because of a buildup of calcium and so you can use isovolemic acceleration as a parameter of your contractility over heart rate and I'll show you this work in a few of the lesions this is work from Michael Chung when he was in Toronto looking at the effect of bypass and congenital operations on function and you can see that after arterial switch for a TGA in the first post-operative day you get a very blunted force frequency relationship so even if you pace the heart and you increase the heart rate the the myocardium doesn't respond with the same force of contraction as it usually should and that tells you that there's dysfunctional uh, myocardium. Tissue velocities are also central at least in the adult uh, world in assessment of diastolic function both in terms of grading the diastolic function and in terms of assessing filling pressures one of the measures of diastolic function and this is based on work by Sherif uh, Nagua from Houston uh, from some years ago showing that the ratio of the blood flow to the tissue velocity in early diastole correlates with filling pressures. So people just say, well, it's a measure of diastolic uh, dysfunction. It is, but remember that it pr predominantly relates to uh, um, filling pressures, not just to any uh, diastolic function. And it also has limitations. It doesn't work in every situation. You need to have relaxation abnormalities. That's forgotten a lot in the literature. And oh, across the board, people just talk about the E to E prime ratio. Now, tissue velocities have important limitations. All you're measuring is motion. And so, you can get uh, easily fooled by tissue velocities, and you have to know that. So here's an example of a left ventricle that's obviously dysfunctional. You can see it's dilated. It doesn't contract very well. But if you pulse the uh, mitral annulus over here, you get quite good velocities because the whole heart here is rocking in the chest. There's motion of the heart. That's called translational motion, so the heart's just moving in the chest. Or you may have a segment that's just being pulled along uh, passively uh, by another segment that's contracting, velocities won't differentiate between that. So you have to uh, remember that. And that's why strain imaging really came uh, about. And uh, uh, strain is just the change in a dimension. And I brought another Canadian example. These are the uh, Canadian Rockies out in Alberta, a very beautiful part of the country. And here's one of those mountains. And you can clearly see that something has deformed the mountain. There's been a force that's acted on the mountain, and the mountain had, has crumpled. It hasn't released, but that's deformation. And in the tissue, we want that to be cyclic. We want the tissue to deform uh, and to lengthen cyclically. And so strain is just a change in the dimension from the original dimension expressed most simply. And the strain rate is the rate at which that happens. So here again is the uh, Rockies. This is the Bow River and the Bow River Valley. And here's a train going through that valley. And the train is traveling, let's say, at the same speed as Matthias's motorcycle at 100 kilometers per hour. And if the whole train travels at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour, then the velocity is 100 kilometers per hour, but the strain is zero. The, the length of the train doesn't change because all the carriages travel at the same speed. Now, if something has to jump on the tracks here and the train suddenly had to brake, the carriages of the train would go into each other, the whole train would crumple, and then you'd get a lower velocity of the train, but you'd get strain, you'd get a change in the length of the train. So that's what strain imaging versus velocity uh, really is. So here are some cartoons to demonstrate that from Pete Klaus in Leuven, and you can see here two segments, and both deform. And so this is, they both have the same strain. Now if I stop this and I activate this one, both of these segments reach the, change their length in the same degree, they have the same strain, but obviously the lower one is doing it much faster than the top one. So the strain rate of the bottom segment is higher than the strain rate of the top segment, even though their strain is the same, and that usually would reflect better contractility, usually, not always. If you look at this segment over here, you can see that the yellow segment is shortening, but this segment isn't changing its dimension. So this is a dead segment of myocardium that's just being pulled, tethered passively by the, acting, uh, by the active segment. 
if you measured velocity in the green and the yellow, both would have the same velocity, but obviously only the yellow segment would develop any strain, whereas strain would be zero in the green segment. So that's how we would use strain versus velocity to talk about myocardial contraction. And you can even get, in very dysfunctional and dead tissue, shortening of one segment and lengthening of another as it's being stretched. And this is not theoretical. We see it in dilated cardiomyopathy the whole time. We see these stretch segments, and they contribute to ventricular uh, inefficiency. Now, you can get strained by uh, really a variety of techniques, and you can get it by M-mode, where you can see here thinning and thickening of the tissue through the cardiac cycle of the septum and of the uh, posterior wall. The problem is with M-mode, you in a very narrow beam, in a very narrow segment, that's what we do with ejection fraction when we use M-mode. We kind of extrapolate to the whole ventricle. So you can get strain from here, and was used in the 70s, I think, and 80s to assess uh, wall function. But obviously, it's a very segmental, very regional, and you want really to measure uh, the function over the ventricle uh, more efficiently. Uh, so as I said, you can derive strain from velocities, and then you can get a number of region of interests. And you can see here longitudinal strain in the longitudinal direction. Uh, you can see uh, how the, the tissue uh, shortens and then lengthens again. So strain in the longitudinal direction is negative because you get shortening of the tissue. Here is radial strain, uh, or strain uh, that is achieved from uh, speckle tracking. And when the ultrasound beams reflect off the tissue, as uh, Norman was talking about, there are local interferences, and those cause patterns of speckles that are very unique to that region and constant from one cardiac cycle, from one frame to the next, just like a fingerprint. So the ultrasound uh, uh, programs can track those speckles from one frame uh, to the next and really tell you how the tissue has deformed uh, over time to, to obtain strain and strain rate. And that's what speckle tracking uh, is. Uh, that's also the limitation of this technique because if the heart moves out of the plane, out of the imaging plane, those speckles disappear and can no longer be tracked and then the programs you know, extrapolate and fill in blank spaces uh, where there isn't really tissue. Vector velocity imaging is a... Uh, is a variant of uh, strain or speckle tracking imaging where there is speckle tracking but there's also tracking of endocardial borders and of the annular points for instance to integrate these uh, together but really it's a speckle tracking technique at its base and then you can get these visual displays uh, of not only the amount of deformation but the, uh, uh, the direction that the tissue is moving in. It's a, it's a vector so it has speed and it has uh, direction. So let's just look at these in a cartoon from the Mayo Clinic that Ben Idem gave me. And you can see here that the heart shortens. It also rotates at the base and at the apex in opposite directions to create this twisting motion. And it thickens in the transverse or the radial plane. What's not shown in this cartoon is also the circumferential shortening. So if you look at the circle that's about to come out here from one of the uh, slices in the heart, this is radial thickening, but the myocardium also thickens in the circular direction to produce circumferential strain. Uh, and we can track that with speckle tracking or with vector velocity imaging uh, to obtain those functional uh, parameters. So, we know that the myocardium shortens for longitudinal strain, it thickens for radial strain, and then it shortens in this direction uh, for circumferential strain. It also twists, as I showed you. So when you get rotation at the base and at the apex, that's not strain. That would be circumferential strain. That's just... Uh, translation really, it's motion of the heart uh, in two opposite directions, but we can track that with the same techniques and we can uh, measure the twist or the torsion, which is the twist over length of the ventricle. This has importance for systolic function, but it also has a lot of importance for diastolic function because the energy built up when the heart twists in systole is then released suddenly in early diastole to create uh, uh, suction effects in the ventricle to help blood rush into the ventricle and fill the heart under low pressures, which is uh, uh, the diastolic function. Now, these techniques can be useful or potentially useful in congenital heart disease for a number of reasons. They're not dependent on geometrical calculations for, uh, to obtain results. 
notice every functional, uh, almost every functional parameter is influenced by the geometry of the ventricle. So when we say they're not dependent on geometrical assumptions, I'm talking about mathematical geometrical assumptions of a sphere or an ellipse or any other uh, shape to obtain a function. They're useful, therefore, for right ventricular and single ventricle physiology. You can get regional function. Uh, they can be acquired bedside, and uh, you can do serial examination. I'm going to skip over this because Norman has told me I'm out of time. Here's three-dimensional strain. But I just wanted to say that there are a lot of remaining uh, problems in their acquisition. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, that's due to these problems. This is why I think it's not yet standard or it's not the major techniques used uh, in clinical uh, laboratories and only three people uh, lifted their hands. Um, but they certainly, I think, can contribute. Here's one of the problems is a large scatter of normal data. So here we have strain uh, between 0 and minus 30, which is obviously not physiologically uh, feasible in normals. It's very difficult to then compare normals to abnormal when you've got such large scatter of data. We have true problems with reliability of the data, inter- and intra-observer reliability, especially in neonates. But we've done quite a bit of work in Toronto on this. We can get reasonable reliability for longitudinal and circumferential strain, very poor reliability for radial strain. So clinically, we, we use longitudinal strain and also circumferential strain. In research, I use radial strain as well, but you've got to know uh, the limitations. So thank you. In the meantime, I'm going to stop here. As Bonnie, uh, as I've mentioned, comes from, uh, from uh, Advocate and Regional General Hospital in Chicago. So I'm going to ask the same questions that Mark asked about cardiac MRI. How many of you use it in your um, practice or order cardiac MRIs for your patients? Oh, good number. All right. Um, and uh, are most of you familiar with looking at the images and so forth? No. So you order it, but then you maybe just get the report. Is that right? So hopefully over the next few days, I'll help you guys know what to look for in their report and how to um, learn to analyze the images so that when the images are put in front of you at conferences and so forth, um, you'll understand uh, the information that's being given to you. Uh, so as you know, cardiac MRI really developed uh, much later than a lot of the other techniques that you've been shown uh, and has become first in adults, uh, uh, a, a huge uh, 
modality to use and now definitely in pediatrics. And a lot of the patients, as they get older, when echo imaging is not as easy of a modality because of um, difficulty in image acquisition from uh, the chest perspective. I'm going to talk to you guys, I'm going to talk to you about uh, several of the modalities today. Cardiac MRI has many different uh, modalities, but rather than showing you all the different techniques, I'm going to show you the ones that uh, we use most often in cardiac MRI uh, with the adult congenitals. So um, cardiac MRI is uh, a very good way to look at pediatric patients and adult patients with congenital heart disease because the anatomy and the acoustic windows as the patients get older become um, not as easy to image. The other reason it's really an improved um, method is because of the volumetric measurements. The left ventricle and the right ventricle, ejection fraction, myocardial mass, and um, regurgitant fraction is much improved with cardiac MRI. We can also get a QPQS fraction. And then the last thing, which is really the most important and has um, found a lot of clinical value is the cardiac tissue, myocardial um, imaging. And so you can look for uh, myocardial injury from different modalities. You can look at it from myocardial infarction, which is how it was initially seen, but you can look at it with myocarditis, with um, patients like Tetralogy of Fallot and Fontan that have had injury for many different things, uh, surgery um, from uh, coronary artery injury, and so forth. So there are, as you see here, I've listed 10 different techniques. Now, this is a huge number. Uh, I don't expect anyone who's not doing performing cardiac MRI to know all of these. And so I'm going to really um, talk about just these five different ones that I find most useful and the ones that I most commonly use. Obviously, if you decide to go into cardiac MRI, you can learn the other ones. So the first one being the cine imaging. This is just like 2D echo. So if you think about it as 2D echo, you're looking at function, you're looking at anatomy, you're looking at um, the different images that it's going to show you. So let me show you guys, since we're short on time, the images. So here is a cardiac MRI from about 10 years ago and a cardiac MRI that's much more recent. And you can see that the uh, contrast of the myocardium versus the blood pool has improved drastically over the last 10 years. You can see a lot of blood um, uh, dephasing here that has improved over the last 10 years. And you can see the contractility is much improved. You can see the detail orientation. How does that compare to our 2D echo? Here's a four chamber of a 2D echo. And here's the four chamber of a cardiac MRI. The chambers, the myocardial edges are much improved with the cardiac MRI, but you can still see that it's equivalent. Here's a 3D chamber. And see the chest wall here. You can see the chest wall here with the cardiac MRI. You can also see the anatomy. Here's the descending aorta descending aorta. Here's a 2D chamber, and this is where MRI is going to be much improved. You can see the 2D of the LV, the RV is not as easy to see. Here is the RV in the MRI image. Here's an example of a patient that has uh, dextra position. Here's the chest wall, four chamber. You can see the LV is anterior. RV is posterior, same thing here, LV being anterior, and once again, you can see the normal um, connections that are occurring, and you can see the normal ejection fraction. So here's an example of a patient who had tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary stenosis and um, a status post repair. You could see the pulmonary sten uh, regurgitation jet here. You can see the right ventricular volume is much increased compared to the LV volume. And that's especially true as you get to the apex where you can see the LV is almost completely 
disappearing and the RV is still quite a bit apparent. So we use those cine images at end systole and end diastole to then draw um, circular shapes over the endomyocardium and the um, epimyocardium in the LV and just the endomyocardium of the RV and that allows us to get a volume both of end systole and end diastole and from that volume we can get a myocardial mass we can get um, an ejection fraction and we get the myocardial mass both at end diastole and end systole and compare the two obviously the myocardial mass is not going to change from one to the other and that allows us to look at the function. From that information we can also, if you're unsure, you can also do the same thing on a four chamber and here's a four chamber, what we call four chamber stack to look at the right ventricle. Um, the right, vent right atrium is quite dilated as well from tricuspid regurgitation and you can see the left ventricle size compared to the right ventricle and how much enlarged it is. And why is this important? Um, and the reason it's important is um, myocardial volumes and ejection fraction by cardiac MRI have really become the gold standard. And that's kind of come through from the adult literature initially. So the biggest reason is if you look at observer one and observer two, the reliability is very accurate. And so you're going to get two, f two physicians getting the same number for your ejection fraction. Then if you look at the same observer, their diastolic volume or their mass and the systolic mass are going to be equal as well. And so you're going to get similar numbers. And lastly, if you look at cardiac MRI compared to radionucleotide, which for a long time was the gold standard, you can see that the numbers are quite accurate. You see quite a bit more scatter when ejection fractions are greater than 60%, but that's not really the patient population you're worried about. When you're worried about a patient and you want to see a patient from um, one month to the next month as you begin a medication, you're going to be worried about the ones with the lower ejection fraction and want to make sure that you can test to see if their ejection fraction is improving as you're starting a new medication or a new treatment or a procedure that you've done. As you look at this um, 2D echo versus MRI, when you're looking at diastolic measurements, so end diastolic diameter, um, and left ventricular posterior wall, really MRI and 2D are almost equal. There's minimal change. When you then look at volume, so ejection fraction and myocardial mass, you see that cardiac MRI is going to have a much better value um, adding on to that. And why does that become important? That becomes extremely important in pediatric patients when you have a smaller number of patients that you can do a study on. If you have a smaller number of patients when you start a medication, you want to be able to see minor changes with less power. We're not going to have 10,000 patients in the study. We'll be lucky if we have 100 or even 1,000. So you can see here when you, start, when you go to MRI from 2D, from two-dimensional images, and then you go to volumetric images, the number of patients you're going to need to see a change in cardiac MRI is significantly lower. You can have 35 patients versus 900 or 2,500 in 2D echo. And same thing again with ejection fraction, 90 patients versus 600 to see the same changes. So cine images is usually done by um, breath holds, but you have patients that are too young to breath hold. Um, and if you don't want to use anesthesia, you can do real time as well. The images are not as crisp, but they're showing you the anatomy quite well as from here. Here's another one by real, 2D real images. You can see the aortic valve here in the center and the um, abnormal opening for a bicuspid aortic valve. Here's a patient with truncus arteriosus who wasn't able to hold their breath. You can see the truncal valve is dilated and abnormal and has a regurgitant fraction. You can see that here as well. And here's the um, RV to PA conduit and um, is widely open. The next thing I'm going to talk about is velocity encoded images. If you wanted to talk about that compared to 2D echo, that's really your um, color uh, mapping that you do in 2D echo, and it's very similar to that. The difference here is that um, you're always going to have your color compare. So if you think about it in color um, 
you could do just the color images, but at times you do the 2D echo versus the color compare. Here you're going to always have the color compare. So here's the cine image that we talked about. Not as high of resolution, but you can see the anatomy. This is a right ventricular outflow track. Right here, you can see the RV, you can see some of the LV, pulmonary artery location, and then the outflow track. And this is the 2D color that I talk about with um, uh, Doppler. In Doppler, we think about it in red and blue. In MRI, you're going to think about it in white and black. And you can see the outflow in white, and then the black is the regurgitation. So the, um, uh, systole the right ventricular outflow track um, ejection in the white, and then the regurgitant fraction in the black. This is an in-plane, so you're seeing the image in-plane. We could also do this in a through-plane. And now what we've done is um, look at the pulmonary valve coming towards you and away from you. And the red is circling it throughout systole and diastole, giving you a regurgitant fraction. So you can get the information that you wanted. Here's the RV outflow track I showed you. You can get the systolic forward flow, the diastolic reversal flow by these images that I talked about. And then you get a, a specific regurgitant fraction, a numerical value. This also helps you with images where the anatomy is not certain. Here's a patient that had a coarctation repair with a graft. You can see right at the anastomosis to the graft, there was a possible um, aneurysm. And then you can see the flow patterns that are occurring into the graft as a value, um, um, as the ejection occurs. Here's the bicuspid aortic valve. And the reason I'm showing you this is this is what we call aliasing in MRI. So there isn't true aliasing in MRI like you think about it in echo, where you reach a Nyquist limit. The Nyquist limit in MRI is 30 meters per second, so you're not going to get that in the human body. But if I put 30 meters per second up on the MRI, everything was going to be gray. So the same way when you look at the pulmonary veins, in 2D echo, you have to turn down your Nyquist limit, otherwise you don't see the veins. The same thing is true for cardiac MRI. I have to put the Nyquist limit or the velocity for MRI to be at a low enough velocity to be able to see the image in black and white. If I put too high of a velocity, everything becomes gray. If I put a velocity that's too low for the velocity that is actually occurring, I'm going to get this pixelation that occurs here. Okay? Now, air is always going to be pixelated. That's where you see out here and what you see in the lung tissue, in the lung. And then the tissue is always going to be gray. So here's the pixelation that's occurring from the velocity being too low that's, that we've actually assigned to the um, MRI machine. You can repeat the image at a higher velocity, and this pixelation will disappear. And I'll show you guys more images of this sort. So here's some more velocity encoded images. Here's an aortic valve. You can see the aortic valve is dilated. And you can see the poor cooptation in the center. But then when you even do the velocity encoded image, you can really see the black dot that's in the center that's causing that. And here is the jet that this velocity is causing. So it doesn't look that big here. But then when you actually look at it in plane, there's quite a bit of a jet. And again, it's pixelating right in the center due to the velocity being quite high. Um, the next uh, phrase I want to really talk about is uh, more of an MRA, or, or uh, excuse me, it's more of a late gadolinium enhancement. And this is where what I said was really unique to cardiac MRI. This is looking at tissues and the tissue itself and looking to see if the tissue has had myocardial injury. This is unique to um, cardiac MRI specifically. So here's normal tissue. It's black. I talk about it looking like a donut. So all black on the outside and white on the inside. And here's when it's injured. So here's the normal tissue. Here's a myocardial infraction in the endocardium. And here's a myocardial infraction that's transmural. Now this can happen with different tissue um, abnormalities. So here's um, the... Uh, specimen and here's a cardiac MRI and you can see where there's a myocardial infarction as well as in magnified you can see the uh, abnormality by tissue straining and then by MRI and you can see it mirrors it very well 
This also happens in myocardial, um, myocarditis. Here you see the normal tissue, and here you see the abnormal tissue, and this is actually in a myocardial pattern, which is right in the mid-myocardium. You can see normal black on the inside, normal black on the outside, and abnormality on the, in the center. And here's the abnormality as well by histopathology. Here's an example of that, so you can see decreased cardiac function, and here's the abnormal tissue pattern right in the center. Here it is in four chamber as well, so decreased cardiac function and the myocardial abnormality. Here's a patient that actually had a pericarditis. We thought he had myocarditis. We took him to the cardiac lab. You can see the normal tissue, nice donut that I was telling you, all black, but you could see the visceral and parietal myocardium are bright here with a small pericardial effusion in, the, in between that. This also happens with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's a very thickened ventricle, and here's the abnormal myocardial injury that's occurred here. The next one I'm going to talk about is um, MRA, or um, an angiogram. And the reason this is important is I think you don't have to be a cardiologist to recognize the abnormality here. I'm not even sure you need to be um, a physician. You can see right from the start that there's a stenosis that's occurring in the coarctation right over here, and the tortuous vessels that are coming in to try and help that coarctation, as well as the um, lima that's quite dilated over here. Here's another example of that. Not as clear because this patient also has a VSD, but you can see the near interruption. And here you can see how the ascending aorta is quite a bit dilated um, all the way up to the head vessels. We could also see this by what we call twist, where we're watching the gadolinium as it enters and goes through. And so here you can see every single level as the gadolinium very similar to cardiac catheterization. Here's the twist as it goes through. And then at every frame that you see here, we can stop it and make it into a 3D rendition. As you can see on the right, we stopped it where the pulmonary arteries are filling. And you can see the stenosis quite a bit at the uh, pulmonary valve site. <coughs> Here's a similar image of a patient that has a dilated arch. And then again, you can see that on the right when you look at the, just the arch itself. Lastly, I'm going to talk about first pass perfusion. This is where we give a contrast and we watch it as it's transversing the um, actual myocardium. Here's a patient four chamber who has an atrial septal defect, you can see the contrast entering and getting washed out <coughs> by the um, uh, blood entering from the left atrium. And then you can, can see the contrast actually once it goes into the left atrium, transversing back into the right atrium. Here's a patient that had a left ventricular aneurysm. And again, you can see the contrast as it enters initially into the myocardium and the aneurysm. Now, contrast in first pass perfusion is mostly used by adults, and the reason it's used by that, the adults is it's looking for defects as the myocardium gets perfused. And so here, you're going to see from the start, the contrast first entering the right ventricle, now the left ventricle. It's now going to go into the coronary arteries. When it goes into the coronary arteries, you can see a black defect here where no contrast is entering the myocardium. And that's a sign that you have coronary artery disease. And I'm really going to stop here um, due to time. But cardiac MRI will eventually become something that we do in the neonates. And um, potentially even before then when uh, um, you're pregnant. Thank you. I'm sorry, we're a little over time. We're going to take 15 minutes. Please be back in 15 minutes, and we will start again promptly at... Uh
Okay. Uh, oh, and for, so for the who is not ready for that?